This was the last presentation of the first session. So thank you for your efforts and impressive pre presentations you have prepared for today. So let's give an, another big round of applause for all of the participants and for yourself. Thank you very much. And with a break, uh, we will begin the second session, which is the sec uh, discussion session moderated by Professor Kirgon Ko. So while our staff is working on the table for the next session, let me introduce our discussant. So first uh, is Professor Kirgon Ko. He is a professor at Graduate School of Pro Public Administration. And he received his PhD in public administration in the University of Pittsburgh. And we are glad to have uh, assistant professor of sociology, Hyun Jung Ha, from Duke Kunshan University, uh, Professor Se Jin Koo from Nazar Bayab University, Dr. Il Hong Ko, and Dr. Jung Won Ha from Asia Center. They will be our honorable discussion, discussants of the session. They will give students some more detailed comments of their country reports and proceed on further in-depth discussion. So please give them a big applause. It must be a long day, <laughs> right? And uh, some students still working for their final exam. And uh, other students may be relieved from the duty of the exam. But uh, regardless of the situation, uh, we have a very good time to understand the each country's situations. Um, the, this, is for, uh, this session is for the discussion. And uh, in this discussion session, we invite the, uh, all the uh, distinguished the doctors uh, the who involved in the review, involved in reviewing your all the, the country report. And uh, they are very familiar with the, uh, what, is the, what are the strengths and the weakness of your report. So they will give some commands. And after the, having this, some comments from this, the, our, uh, the, this, our panelist, and then the, we will take some uh, questions from the floors. And the, probably you must have a lot of the questions during your the, uh, preparing the reports. For example, some of you may be interested in uh, the, the data, or the, some of you are want to compare the your cases, your country's cases with the Korea or other countries. So though I will open the floor after getting the, the commands from the, our panelists. So the, uh, the here uh, we have the, uh, the panelists, but uh, I wanted to ask each panelist to introduce themselves and then give the commands to the students. Uh, uh, Dr. Ko, would you please? Um, hello everyone, my name is Iron Ko. I'm an, actually an archaeologist and um, I'm currently based at um, Seoul National University Asia Center as a research fellow. Um, shall, shall I start with my... So um, I was given four papers, four reports to um, assess and they were number two from Peru, um, the first uh, both from France and the one from Trinidad and Tobago. And as I think the only person who is present amongst the reports that I evaluated was Trinidad and Tobago. The other French, uh, is, Fr is France number one here? France number two? And um, Peru number two? Oh, um, no, I think mine was Peru number, are you, you're not Celia, Cecilia Torres, you're not. <laughs> so the other, the other Peru. 
I evaluated those. So what I shall do is maybe spend a bit more time on, the, um, on my comments for the Trinidad and Tobago report and then um, briefly just comment about the other ones. Um, I found this um, report very, very well researched and very well structured. And it was from a country that I do not know very much about. Um, and so it provided, it provided me with a very clear and detailed presentation about how the COVID situation has evolved in Trinidad and Tobago. And what I found very interesting was how you presented your data. It was presented in very, very um, intelligible forms, very pretty <laughs> um, forms as well. And yet some, so, and there was a diversity in the way in which the, da uh, the data was presented in that some of the data was a kind of presenting a compilation of the trends, whereas other was um, the, some, other of the, uh, some of the other data were in um, raw data form, allowing, and I thought that was very interesting because when you're reading such country reports, one, one of the objectives is to learn what things are, what, what, what it's like in Trinidad and Tobago. But another reason that one would maybe um, be interested in these country reports is to get data from the various countries and perhaps um, compared with the data in Korea, et cetera, et cetera. And in order to do that, the data has to be in a kind of, um, in, a, in a, a form that you can actually compile with other forms of data. And I think your um, reports presented both types very well. And um, another fact that I found in reading your um, report very interesting was that how in presenting the economic structure of Trinidad and Tobago, you mentioned how the peak, um, peak economic um, activities take place just around the time when um, COVID was happening and how that influenced and how that had an impact. And I thought those kinds of insights are very interesting because you, know, you can Google things about the actual economics, the, the base facts about the economics of Trinidad and Tobago, I could Google, but those kinds of insights about how you know, March and February are very important. I think that is what you would like to gain from a country report such as this. And I also found your mention of the existence of a parallel healthcare system for COVID-19 very, very interesting. And um, also, you know, your mentions of the salary grants and the, and I think especially the salary grant bit is interesting because it would provide maybe later um, act as a useful tool to compare the different responses in terms of in unemployment, etc. I also, and the other thing I found really interesting about um, the report was where you were mentioning the tropical climate aspect about, because it's very tropical, people like to congregate, out, congregate outside. And I suppose one of the problems is then with the carnivals and things like that, when you're you know, outside in these densely, you know, dense numbers, um, COVID might, spread widely. But then it's very interesting because the Korean, currently the Korean government is saying if you're outside, you don't have to wear a mask. It's when you're inside that you have to wear a mask. So I was wondering if this kind of outdoor activity aspect of Trinidad and Tobago may have influenced your, the, the way in which your cases have dropped. And um, also in relation to your presentation, I also found your comments about how, you know, in preparation for the hurricane, hurricane season, how you, the new normal is now required in terms of that kind of disaster relief. And so oh, these were all very you know, good, interesting points. I was thinking, however, that perhaps you might have, because you obviously have the means to you know, access very good data, so perhaps in, if you were to update this uh, report, you could um, present in more raw forms the various types of data that you presented in, its, in, the, in the compiled forms. And, as, um, and yes, one of the things that I found very interesting was how you mentioned how because Trinidad and Tobago is a very multicultural, multi-religious um, society, they didn't, it's not like in Korea where you could offer food because it might not meet the dietary standards of the different people. So you were saying in your report that you, they gave it to the religious institutions, and they were the ones that handed this out. And I, I was quite curious to know how this worked, but um, you didn't go into that in depth. And I think someone from another country would be very, very interested in that aspect. And um, also, in this, the second comment is in relation to the first, the Peruvian report that I um, examined. It was saying that in Peru, 
uh, not only domestic violence, but um, sexual violence towards children and teenagers um, increased as a result of everyone being in lockdown. And I was wondering, you know, if you could talk about maybe, because when you were talking about the social aspects, it was social in terms of society, but not very social in terms of how it influenced the individual. And so perhaps if you were to update your um, report, you could talk about that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the, actually, the, each uh, panelist uh, well, prepared their own comment in a document form. So the, if you need uh, more, uh, if you need their comment, then the, we will send uh, each the panelist the uh, comments to to you through the email. Okay. Okay. And the, uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Prof. Uh, the Dr. Ha. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hyun Jung Ha, and I am a visiting research fellow at Seoul National University's Asia Center. And I'm also an incoming assistant professor of sociology at Duke Kunshan University, located in China. So due to uh, current situation with COVID-19, I wasn't able to get a visa to move to China this summer. So unfortunately, I am going to start my career here in Seoul teaching online. But fortunately, I was able to join this symposium, which I think very uh, grateful. So I would like to congratulate all of you, awarded or not, for completing a research paper about uh, such an important topic with grave impacts on uh, human history. So serving on a review committee, it was such an exciting opportunity for me to learn a lot about how different countries and different political actors have responded to COVID-19. Uh, differently from Dr. Ko, I think I would provide a uh, general comment, uh, why, comments I had while reading your papers. I read four papers on Iran, Uzbekistan, Peru, and Trinidad and Tobago. So the papers we reviewed uh, focus on safety measures and medical and policy responses to contain the spread of the disease. And it was very helpful to understand how other countries have reacted differently or similarly to the pandemic. Some of the good things that those papers did really well include they provided detailed uh, investigations about how political actors implemented such uh, uh, different uh, policies. But at the same time, um, the papers used, the proper, used properly uh, figures and images and, and sources also in their own languages. Otherwise, we're not able to be uh, accessible to many people. And I really also uh, want to praise that you use some of the comparative perspectives to understand how your own countries responded uh, to COVID-19 similarly or differently to their reactions um, to those uh, existing or historical um, diseases that they had to uh, deal with, and also your comparison with the South Korean case. And I have some of the suggestions that I want to make for your improvement. If you are considering uh, any kind of publications or even a collaborative work to promote more of a comparative perspective. So I find that some of the papers were largely descriptive. So they provide a lot of detailed, good information, helpful information. But I would like to see more of an analytical perspective. So the questions can come. Uh, including what kind of political systems were more effective or responded more successfully compared to others, what kind of policies paid off while others were not, and what kind of social and cultural responses were like, and what, were, uh, what did have, what kind of responses helped um, control the situation from the social, civil society perspective. So considering those questions might be able to help you put your questions in a more analytical perspective. And so we can uh, also see some kind of a comparative perspective as well. And the second uh, comments or suggestion that I would like to make is, while we know that the virus has hit the elderly 
and to those with underlying this disquiet heart. But we would also want to know what kind of civil, what kind of social and cultural um, context the country has had, especially with some of the more vulnerable groups, who are more weaker groups, or um, who had weaker ties with the government. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, weak, weaker ties with the government. So those questions, uh, or including some, some other questions like, uh, what are the particular social structures and institutions that have caused massive infection, for example. So we could think about some South Korean cases with uh, patients with mental illness or patients with rehab centers and nursing homes. They uh, were heavily affected, severely affected by the disease. And we also see some of the religious meetings have, uh, be have becoming a new epicenter of the spread of the disease. And uh, as a sociologist who studies the Middle East, I would like to pr provide a very brief overview about the current situations of the region. Maybe one of the, one of the important re lessons that we have learned from this COVID-19 situation would be the virus is equal, but people are not, or society is not, right? So I think I would like to urge you to see the, the vulnerable parts of the society. So when we uh, think about the Middle East, we have several countries with ongoing civil war, including Syria, Libya, and Yemen. We also have some of the countries uh, with people put in uh, refugee camps, including um, Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. And also we have some of the Gulf areas, uh, Gulf countries with foreign laborers, foreign labor workers, mostly from coming from South um, Asia. So these are uh, some of the vulnerable groups that we can think about. So um, some of your papers, you were talking about international collaborations. So I think that uh, that uh, approach could be applied to think about how as an international society we could help those countries to um, overcome such crisis together uh, and contribute the current situation. And uh, the other, uh, yes, so uh, right now after Ramadan and Eid Fitr, uh, some, many Middle Eastern countries are experiencing the second wave of the confirmed cases. So, for example, in Iran, more than 200,000 confirmed cases were found as of today, with more than uh, 10,000 deaths. And, for example, in, in Egypt, we have more than 50,000 cases with uh, 4,000 deaths. So, even though the government have tried hard to authoritatively to control travel, gathering, and collective prayers, uh, we see the second like spike in the number of people tested positive for the corona, uh, COVID-19 in many Middle Eastern countries. So uh, this kind of some social and cultural religious situations should be take into taken into consideration to understand the region. Uh, and finally, we have seen uh, xenophobia, racism against Asians across the country, across the globe, and the Middle East was not the exception. Even with a comparatively shorter history of immigration of Asian, Asians, uh, Egypt, for example, was not an exception that have shown some kind of an aggressive and intimidative responses to Asians by yelling at them or uh, pointing at them uh, by saying corona, corona on the streets. So those are social aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic could be, could have more uh, longer term uh, impact. So this is something that we have to consider as an important consider even after the situations are getting better. So I would like to congratulate you all again for uh, accomplishing, for your great accomplishment and also best wishes for your continuing research and studies. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cook, please. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for giving me this precious opportunity to read your papers and you know, give you comments.
Uh, I just focused it more on how to improve the papers to make it a sort of a publishable paper. So I uh, paid attention to the academic format in particular. Uh, well, first of all, the paper uh, on the, the Trinidad and Tobago, this paper provides a great overview uh, on how this country is faring in the COVID-19. Uh, I think this is a, a, you know, written pretty well in a plain language that can be readable even for you know, those who don't really know about this country very much. Um, but in particular, given that information circulated through the media uh, regarding this pandemic is um, focusing mostly on a few limited number of Western countries in particular, heavily focused on the United States, I think this paper is expected to make a pretty valuable contribution to the literature about how uh, developing countries are coping with this pandemic as well as to practitioners in the medical and intergovernmental sectors. Um, well, among my comments, yeah, I want to just uh, highlight one of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the organization issue, the section controlling COVID-19 by different actors. I think this section can be better organized. I suggest each major actor be discussed under subsection title. Uh, such as governmental measures, international collaboration, private non-governmental actors, and so on. Uh, also, uh, this section is a bit too brief, broad. Uh, as mentioned by Professor Ko, what does it more specific? What does it more specifically look like? A religious organizations' distribution of essentials to different uh, racial groups or ethnic groups. If their activities does not worth mentioning more specifically. And I suggest to, to simply delete this discussion. Uh, and also the section impacts of COVID-19 can also be better organized, such as impacts on resale sector, impacts on tourism sector, unemployment, poverty, education, and so on. You don't have to, you know, uh, to discuss everything. Actually, you know, it would be almost impossible in a short paper and not publishable then. So you can just focus on a few or just a couple of them. Yeah. Also adding trend figures in macroeconomic indicators like changes over time before and during the pandemic will help. Uh, also the paper on the United States, uh, it, this report covers a great deal of social and political issues related to the pandemic in the United States context. Uh, well, I suggest in the intro section, uh, student, to include some couple of figures, tables, visually presenting the trend and major events uh, that will help readers to grasp the many, many numbers presented in the first and second pages. Yeah. And this paper can be better organized. For example, uh, this, there is a sentence like mortality rate for COVID-19 cases has you know, remained. You know, this kind of uh, sentences are uh, are followed by somehow not so much directly related uh, connected sentences. So it will be great if you provide some context if this is important. Um, so I suggested to create a separate subsection regarding the US specific phenomena like varying mortality rates across different races. Uh, uh, and because this would make the US an interesting case, a unique case of the COVID-19 when compared to other countries. It is understandable that the, this topic of China and US relations is included in this report, but the lengthy discussion on the campaigns and propaganda of the Chinese government itself seems to make the entire paper less coherent. So, um, so I suggested to sort of uh, remove or delete some parts of this section. And uh, the sentences are overall too, too long. <laughs> yeah, very hard to read for the readers. Uh, and then lastly, um, a paper on Uzbekistan. Uh, I think this paper is also making a valuable contribution to our understanding on developing countries, especially, especially in Central Asia. Um, uh, what caught my eyes in particular is the organization of this paper successfully making clear divisions between various COVID-19 topics by providing sort of a small titles for each small section and subsection. Uh, but it could be better formatted as an academic paper. Uh, for example, the figures and tables, they always need titles, figure title, table title. 
Yeah. And also the titles must give a clear hint of what the figure table is about. Um, and the sources as well. As well. Uh, and secondly, the government announcements are really well documented here, but those can end up as hot air. It can declare various measures to be taken, but what is also equally interesting is to what extent the government decisions are implemented. You know, there are a lot of issues in Central Asia like corruption, well, implementation in, can be a totally different issue in, in, in these countries. Um, and also, um, although it is interesting to learn about Uzbekistan government chartered flights for delivery of its citizens to homeland as Kazakhstan did, uh, this paper does not provide any specific information further about this. And the first half of, half of the section, impact and challenges of the COVID-19, uh, is about government decisions rather than impact and challenges. So in this section, I suggest you focus more on the changes in macroeconomic indicators before and during the pandemic, change in, changes in the public opinion towards the government, maybe disruption in the provision of medical services, short-term and long-term issues in healthcare workforce, you know, and so on. There are several different kinds of things you can you can you know deal with. Of course, you, you don't have to deal with all of these issues yeah, in this paper. Yeah. And um, well, you know, overall, the, the the while I reading the papers, I became very interested to in in the issues like how people are responding. So now we learned a lot. I learned a lot through the papers how governments are uh, reacting, responding to the uh, pandemic, but how people, ordinary people, are responding to it. Well, in, as an expert in Central Asia, the, the problem of, in Central Asia is that people really don't trust what government says. This is a really big problem. First of all, the government has to say, okay, the COVID-19, you don't have to worry very much. You know, life has to continue. You know, it's okay. At the same time, they have to say COVID-19 is real. So people, you know, a lot of people are, are saying in, in these countries, well, gov the government is sort of uh, lying and we don't really trust what they are saying and maybe it's fake. Maybe somebody is trying to get benefit from it, uh, you know, like masks. You know, why, do they, why do we need masks? Why do we have to buy it? It's just for someone who wants to you know, make money through it. You know, this kind of conspiracy theory is uh, prevailing. Uh, and also the corruption issues as well. The government's trying to give a certain sort of subsidies to individual citizens, but it, you know sometimes the call center is not working, and some you know there is a system error as well. And also corruption issues are always followed in in this kind of a situation. Um, another issue uh, is that in Central Asia, you know, there is always full season every year, always. So will this time this pandemic? Uh, maybe it's fortunate for these countries. It occurred during, you know, it, it, from March, April, and May. But you know, the flu season is coming, like from December and January, and they are they have to actually preparing the prolonged uh, period of this pandemic until at least until early next year. And during this flu season and the harsh winter season, the food supply problem will be really, you know become very serious in, the, in these countries. The, the prices are soaring up, usually not, not without the pandemic. Um, so, you know, inflation, unemployment, these issues, these country governments needs to deal with sort of uh, until, until the end of the pandemic or maybe next year, maybe later. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, Dr. Ho, please. Hello, my name is Jung Won Hyu. I'm a research fellow at the uni University um, Asia Center. Um, first of all, thank you all for this excellent presentation today. It was great pleasure to, all, to review all your papers. It was also a very great learning experience for me too, because as a um, research fellow at the Asia Center and also a member of Seoul National University COVID-19 Research Network, I am collecting um, the data and analyze them to find a way to contain um, COVID-19 pandemic every day. So <clears throat> we wanted to, uh, actually, I mean, I wanted to know how to, 
how to control the pandemic. So we monitor the daily new confirmed cases from different countries to see if any of them um, to find a way to successfully bend the curve. So when we find the prosperous countries, we try to understand which um, government measure, the response measure, contribute to success. But actually, every government nowadays on the globe, everywhere, so actually they are um, responding under huge pressure to act fast. So, um, so this sometimes means that they, they may act without considering the diverse perspective or they have to make a decision without the proper evidence. That's why we need to um, learn from others' experience at this, under this pandemic. So under this pandemic, I was also, but we have um, very advanced technology today. So I would, under this pandemic, I was very amazed by the ICD technology made of great progress right away. So I think many of you uh, prepared, when you prepared this um, country report competition, I may, you must have very familiar with um, some website, data website, right? So the Worldometer and the WHO's website, data website. Some Oxford, right, the Oxford economist made a great website, great, great um, storytelling website with their data. And also the Oxford the government response tracker. So you, some of you may you used um, those stringency, agent, stringency index in your report. So we know that they provide great data to we understand the mechanism of this pandemic. But um, sometimes the numbers and formatted, formatted data tell overall the story of their current status and help us to compare the com COVID-19's impacts on the different countries, but um, sometimes they won't tell the context of their success, so each country's context and their history. So that's why we, we need this country report. So let's look into the countries. Um, I'm um, very interested in the Southeast Asia country. So I reviewed the, um, the three papers from Vietnam and the Malaysia and the Philippines. It was all of our great report. I learned a lot about your country's success or experience. <coughs> so Southeast countries are relatively very less infected than other countries. That is amazing. So some of the countries, Indonesia and Singapore, are still struggling with the pandemic infection cases. But Vietnam and the Cambodia and also the Laos, they have the zero fatal cases. That is amazing because many of the Southeast um, Asian countries are low or um, middle or lower income countries. So, they, but they are successfully control their um, pandemic situation. So, um, but uh, after we analyze the, those countries' data, we actually we uh, have to admit we quite don't understand that the. Um, each country's current social and political and economic situation with those um, those situation how their those situation contribute to the your success so we need we realize we need more nuanced information to apply those successful response measures to the countries so who need to act immediately so I Actually, I'm going to give your individualized comment through the email, but I want to um, introduce the, some of the research questions I was very impressed by in your our grand prize winner from Vietnam, num number one team. So their research question is here. Viet Vietnam is so far has recorded only more than 300 cases and no deaths. It has been over a month since the country had no new cases in the community and the Vietnam is starting to reopen economic and social activities. What makes the v Vietnam and the populous lower middle income country in Southeast Asia with more than a thousand kilometers of borders with China with many difficulty and constraints in finance and health system was able to achieve such impressive results? 
That is kind of actually the research question we want to know from your country report. It was a very impressive research question. You execute the research very good. So also, your the conclusion is very impressive too. So apparently, the fight against the COVID-19 has not come to an end, and it is still too early to rejoice. But these results are a testament to the disease prevention and treatment effort of Vietnam. So in order to achieve this preliminary success, the first of the contribu contribution, uh, contributor of this success is party and government of Vietnam play critical role right, with <coughs> the right direction and drastic action since the early beginning of the pandemic. So the, the second impressive thing the Vietnamese government did is Vietnam is aware of the very danger, uh, aware of the danger posed by the COVID-19 and promptly implemented measures. Very um, deterministic action. That is, I think, the second question, uh, second um, contribution, contributors. And so, so they did. Um, they did that. It implemented the measures um, even before the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency. So they, the, with the experience, the third, um, third contributors of the success is the experience of the struggling with the previous outbreak, such as a public health emergency, the SARS and other diseases. So. I think you guys have a great um, achievement to show us. So that is very impressive. And why I think, and but the one thing I really wanted to see from your reports, but I didn't see, is um, the the global cooperation. Why we care about other countries' experience and other countries' response measures. Because COVID-19 affects all of us. So <clears throat> everyone is at risk. As long as COVID-19 exists any, anywhere in the globe, no one is safe anymore. So we have to care about other countries' experience, other countries struggling. So that's why we need those, we need those kind of competition to share our experience together. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, as uh, the chair of this discussion sessions, I have to summarize all the comments, but uh, all the, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, all the panelists provide the, uh, very useful comments. However, if I have to summarize all the comments, then uh, I can say a couple of issues first. Data matters. Data here does not necessarily mean the number of things. In fact, your description of your country's status can be a data. So the, there are so many data out there, and uh, this data is generated by the, uh, the domestic or the international organizations, and uh, many people actually fail to access the domestic data. And that is, I think, the, uh, one of the big, biggest contribution you did for the international society. So we have to rely on the, like Johns Hopkins University's data or the uh, EC, uh, European CDC's data or the Oxford's data, but they do not tell much about what's going on in each country. So the, providing these kinds of the uh, local knowledge would be very, I think, the, should be valued by the other people. Uh, so the uh, data is really important, and the many comment the discussions already mentioned that the how we wisely use the data is another issue. Data is out there, but we have to link the, this data into the context and also into our research question. Data not driven by the question is useless. So you should uh, first raise the uh, relevant questions and then the link this the uh, data to that question to answer or the, to find the uh, answers. Okay. And so uh, the the question, relevant question, is uh, very important, and some of you already already they pro provide very insightful questions, and I hope we can develop these questions. And the third issue is this question is not necessarily related to the government sectors. 
or the economic issues. It can be more about the sociological issues, cultural issues, and a variety of the other uh, issues. So that we have to expand our eyes toward beyond, uh, the beyond our the, uh, the imminent issues. In fact, the impact of the COVID-19 will last longer than we expect. And uh, that would be very comprehensive than we imagine. So that you can, uh, you can bring the uh, more the innovative and creative research questions uh, covering the uh, many uh, uh, issues. And third, um, many students uh, talk about the uh, the role of the governments, and the, some uh, the, some the discussions already mentioned that the, the the governments play a significant role, but uh, there are other actors out there. And these actors can be international organization, or the civil society organization, or even the individuals. So we should not underestimate these kinds of the role of the other actors, because the COVID-19 uh, bring a little bit negative impacts to the global society. The negative impact would be, the, we may imagine that the government can do some things, but in fact, the most of things, positive things or the negative things can be done not because of the government but because of the citizens. Citizens are the actors of the social distancing. And citizens try to help each other in the communities. So if we underestimate the role of the, uh, the citizens but overestimate the uh, role of the government, then the future of the post-COVID-19 uh, era uh, would be a little bit too much authoritarian than we imagined. So we have to go back, get back to the, our original ideas before the, the, the COVID-19 started. Uh, we talk about the democracy, we talk about the free trade, and we talk about the more exchange of the idea and people. Uh, but where is this kind of the, the idea of democracy or international co collaboration uh, uh, exists in the post-COVID-19? We talk too much about the uh, uh, active role of the government and the travel bans or the controlling the humans, uh, the freedoms, and so forth. So they are a little bit concerned about the too much government-centric approach. And the finally, um, the developing country situation is very diverse. And this diversity actually provides uh, new ideas how to overcome this uh, COVID-19. Some countries suffer from the, shorty, uh, the, the decline of the limiters, and other countries talk about the uh, decline in the uh, tourist, uh, tourism industry, and uh, some countries talk about the, uh, the growing, uh, decline of the economy. But in fact, if we look at the uh, Vietnam data set, data, then I can find that some industry in Vietnam actually the, uh, getting better. Uh, the, some industries in the, uh, export is the much better than before. So there are the, some differences in, within the countries or the, between the countries. And these kinds of differences means that if international society try to help the developing countries, then uh, we have to figure it out the, uh, more the country-specific solutions. Uh, without uh, considering these differences, uh, but just to provide a general solution to developing countries, uh, these kinds of general solution uh, may not work in each countries, So the, we have to understand these diversities. And this diverse understanding of the diversity allow us to uh, learn more universal lessons from the COVID-19. So diversity and the universality is, uh, should not be uh, the contradictory concept. So the, uh, today, we got the uh, more uh, the ideas about the different situation of the countries. And this should be uh, translated into more general ideas of how to collaborate each other for uh, rebuild our international communities. Okay, I think that is the uh, major message uh, from the, our the, the, the commentators and uh, also the, uh, from the, the contributors of the, this uh, COVID-19 reports. Okay, I will stop here and uh, I will open the, all the, the, uh, open the floor to get the uh, questions about any issues about this COVID-19 cases uh, or, okay, so please feel free to ask any questions. Okay, please. Uh, would you identify yourself first? Of course, I know you. <laughs> um, 
My name is George Asensubobe from Ghana, a student of GSPA, GMPA program. Um, I have a comment and then I just want to elicit uh, 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 your views on something as well. Uh, the comment is on when uh, Professor Ko was speaking about the government-centric approach to dealing with uh, COVID-19. Uh, I believe those of us coming from uh, developing countries, uh, the government is actually central to everything we do. And the private sector is a bit limited in uh, contributing to some of these things until government provides them the platform. So I think the different systems does not allow uh, the private sector to be integral in dealing with issues of this nature. That is my comment. Uh, the other thing is I just want to know your opinion on WHO's new protocols in terms of re uh, uh, discharging COVID-19 infected uh, people. Uh, it so happened that now they are claiming the virus is, is very potent during the very uh, early stages. Due to that, my country, for instance, over the weekend, we had actually our 14,000 active cases, but we discharged over 10,000 people because we, used to, we were using a very rigorous approach into uh, discharging people, but because of the new directives, we have to discharge people quite early. So I'm just wondering, what, what is your opinion on this, especially we looking at dealing with COVID-19 and eventually eradicating it. What is your opinion on the uh, review protocols in terms of releasing uh, patients because when after 14 days, virtually they, they, they are no more, they, are, they become asymptomatic as opposed to being symptomatic. Thank you. to me or the other the discussion? No, to all. To, to all. Anybody can comment. Okay, the, uh, the first uh, comment is about me, that he advised me do not underestimate the government. Yes, I'm, in, uh, I'm a professor of public administration. I make money by criticizing the government or the supporting the government, so I would not the underestimate the role of the government. Uh, but the second question is very important, and this is pretty much, I think, the practical question. How we, what will be the best strategy to release the patients? Uh, should it be the uh, two weeks or the three weeks or the earlier? Uh, there are many uh, different ideas. And the WHO or international organization do not provide a good idea on that. So the, is there, uh, are there any want to answer the question about the appropriate time for releasing the, uh, the patients? Do you, anyone? George, you should not ask such kinds of things to us. Okay. Well, I can't answer to that question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm a social scientist. But you know, the, the, the problem is, is more important problem is that you know, most of the beds are always, almost fully filled in the hospitals. In, in case of Central Asian countries, you know, they are accepting only most severe uh, symptom uh, patients only. Uh, and you know, most others they are not accepted almost at all to the hospital. Uh, so you know, the problem is you know how the, the, the lack of medical staff who can who can uh, provide treatment to those uh, patients with uh, severe symptoms, uh, and also the lack of a medical uh, staff, the medical medicines uh, in those countries. Yeah, and, and you know, the uh, painkillers, they are all almost sold out in the pharmacies and people cannot even buy painkillers, uh, you know, just the local communities. Uh, so these are actually the most important problems in, in the Central Asian context, I think, yeah. Yes. But in the news, I was reading how there are different strains of genetic strains of the coronavirus, and there are three main strains, are there not? And so you had the one that came earlier in Korea was the one from China, and you have a mutated version, I think, in America. 
and they say there's another version. And it seems that the mutated version in America is much more um, virulent. And so, and there has, have been some suggestions that the second wave in Korea might be related to the, the, the strain from America. And if, from, and if there are three different strains, and if they, the way in that they, the way the virus acts is different among strains, I was thinking that it would be um, quite logical to have three different approaches to how you deal with this, and perhaps that's something that the WHO should be doing. And it did occur to me in um, having in looking at all of your presentations that maybe a pr it might the different because the different countries obviously will have different strains. And I don't know if you have had the capacity. Each country has the capacity to identify which strain it is. But it would be interesting to in the future um, look at the cases in that kind of um, context to categorize according to the strain and then see how that worked or how the virus developed or how it affected society in that way. Okay, um, if I add the uh, one cent to the uh, George's question, uh, the first thing is that about the, uh, the, uh, the best time for releasing the patients. Uh, discharging policy is, would be different across the countries, but uh, the WHO actually uh, should do this, but unfortunately the WHO did, does not provide a good advice. But in Korea, a couple of days ago, uh, the many the medical doctors investigate the cases and they find out that the two weeks would, would be too long. Uh, based on the scientific research, they find out, try to propose the more appropriate and rational uh, the days uh, for releasing the uh, patients. So the, each country should uh, find out which days would be good. But at least at this moment, if we follow the uh, advice from the Korean medical doctors, uh, two weeks would be too long. And the second uh, advice from the medical doctors is that we have to prioritize the patients. The young people like you uh, would not necessarily to go to the hospital. You can stay at home. But all people like me should be well cared. So the, this is the, the kinds of prioritizing the patients. Uh, we have to the, provide the uh, very, very rare medical resources to the urgent patient first. So that we have to the, uh, develop some plans how to wisely use this, uh, the, 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 the medical resources. And probably that would be related to how we quickly discharge, discharge the patients. That depends on the uh, country situation, okay? But the bottom line is, uh, to get the uh, good idea, we should do research first. That is the, actually the role that the WHO and the international community, uh, uh, the professors of the international uh, society should do for the people, okay? Any questions? Okay, I should be in charge of these things because okay, the, the I have to the uh, the clarify this the country report projects. Now all the project would be the online if you want, and uh, the, this uh, the each uh, this country's the COVID uh, this country report would be revised or the uh, or the other external com commentators uh, will ask you to change some contents. And at the, at the, uh, if we do this pro, uh, process uh, uh, over and over, then the, we come in to realize that the, who are the authors and the, who are just the contributors and the, who should be the first or the second author like that. Uh, we do not actually the, uh, the argue the, uh, these kinds of the authorship things. 
the, all this the country report prepared by our contributors is just contributors. And then the, once we feel that, the, okay, the quality of the country report is really good, then I, uh, the, this uh, the, uh, RA, Asia Regional Information Centers, uh, will uh, try to prepare the publication as a report or the book, uh, small the monograph. But the, the target, the, the major goal is not just for, uh, not, it's not for the academic publication. We want to use this opportunity to the, the share the information with the other sides, other part of the world. So, and, but uh, it, it's up to you. The, uh, if you want to join, if you want to, the, to, you, uh, to the, uh, share your uh, country report to the ARIC website, then you can do it, and we will be very happy to do that, and also to give the comments. Uh, and our adding members and uh, our professors uh, will uh, go provide the uh, constructive comments to improve the uh, quality of the, your country's report. So I had one more question about the publication thing. So I think it, we need a lot of effort to publish this into the academic journal. But I can I think if you want to publish your country report as a book, so we can publish the electronic version of the books we publish on the website, but we have the ISBN, so it will be count as a book. So we can pursue that goal. Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to my reviewer for the great comments. I wrote it kind of in a rush. Uh, so I appreciate that you took the time to even read the whole thing because I look back at it. I'm I'm so sorry and thank you. <laughs> um, also, just one second. Uh, I realized I left something out of my presentation. I just wanted to go on the record and say uh, that I don't blame protesters uh, for uh, speaking out against what happened, uh, and that the situation was considerably worsened by the fact that police used tear gas uh, and which caused people to cough, which caused people to spread the virus even more. Just wanted to go on the record and say that. Okay, now I have a question. Um, so we've seen in this situation that uh, uh, powers like the United States kind of failed to provide uh, the type of global leadership that has like, normally been seen in the past in this sort of situation. So I was wondering what you would think if uh, middle powers such as South Korea or a lot of the countries that came here today were to uh, kind of form their own network, perhaps, perhaps within the WHO uh, or another international organization where they can kind of collaboratively, collaboratively uh, form uh, norms around democratic uh, global health governance. Because I think Professor Cole mentioned uh, concerns about um, uh, democracy in the post-COVID era because a lot of countries are kind of implementing uh, like surveillance technology that could be abused in the future. So for instance, maybe an, an app like the one being used in South Korea could be combined with the legal framework used in the EU for the GDPR, uh, something like that. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, would that be feasible? Would it be helpful? Uh, that's it, yeah. Clarify your question. So, do you are you interested in the, the new global orders uh, beyond the two superpower or the the future of the democracy? Which one is the, your main question? I guess kind of both, um, because so I think a lot of countries have kind of realized that leader superpower leadership is not a given anymore in a global crisis, uh, whether it be from the United States or China or someone else. Uh, but middle powers, because of their position within the international network, are incentivized to be collaborative or creative, uh, coming up with solutions to face these kind of problems because of their more limited resources. And so they have to work together. So I'm, I'm asking, like, if a more formalized institution or network were formed, uh, do you think where, where middle powers could kind of talk to each other about this, would it be helpful? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, 
the I'm a well social scientist. <laughs> so the I I'm not much uh, an an expert of this the IL international relations. But um, let me think about these things. We are talking about the United States and the China many times. And still, the post-COVID-19 order would be related to China and the United States. And we, the, your question is: Is there, well, will, would, would be, would there be a the middle ground between the uh, U.S. and the China? Unfortunately, history says the third world we called the, the like a bipolar in the during the Cold War they are a bipolar system, but uh, many developing countries tried to consolidate their uh, international kinds of positions, uh, creating the new alliance. But unfortunately, it was not that much successful. The worst thing is a lot of the economic foundations and the global value chain has been damaged. And uh, it will take a lot of time and uh, resources for the developing country to restore these value chains and their economic foundations. Probably, I think, these kinds of dilemma make developing countries try to uh, strengthen their ties with the superpowers. So the developing country may be enforced to choose their alliance. That is, I think, my personal understanding of the post covenant global uh, international order. Of course, there would be other options. But the, when you think about the other options, or if you want to think about the uh, middle ground, then you have to ask two things. Who will lead this, the, uh, the third group, third uh, countries groups? Second. What would be philosophical or political ideology binding these developing countries? Without the leadership, without ideology, it would not be feasible to formulate this the third world. Okay. I'm here today and um, for your hard work on reading on the research paper and give us very um, detailed and uh, thoughtful comment. We are really grateful for that. Um, it's, um, I, I really want to thank you, um, all of you, and also all the, the uh, member team for coming here today. It has been, um, you know, you have opened a you know, a very interesting platform for every country not to only dig in uh, to research in, of their own countries, but also to um, such an um, eyes-opening experience to learn about other countries. And like for us, I think today um, we are uh, all very special country because uh, we are very diverse. There are so many countries here today, and we learn so many new knowledge and experience. That wow, we just yeah, we have never thought of that before. So um, I know that uh, since. The COVID-19 breakout, um, nationalism or uh, protectionism has been emerging, and globalization has never faced such kind of difficult difficulty and challenges. However, I think that um, uh, globalization and international uh, cooperations still remains as our hope for the future. And um, as we are here, uh, you know, uh, the young um, intellectual of the every country we should work together and you know to uh, for further uh, research and um, further work and to you know to keep uh, watching at how COVID-19 gonna change the world and I think um, the future is unpredictable but we will always be positive and um, looking forward for a better future for all thank you so much <laughs> So, is there any more 
question or comments from floor? Well, Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So actually, this is our second competition of the COVID-19 country report. Before we um, have this the campus-wide COVID-19 country report competition, we had um, the GMPA COVID-19 competition. GMPA means Global Master of Public Administration, which is led by um, Professor Ko. So we, before we finish this event, can we um, join to award that winners? Okay, uh, here? here is a small <laughs> yes. uh, the background. Before uh, starting this SNU level COVID-19 country report competitions, we, the GMPA, the graduate, uh, uh, graduate uh, Global Masters of Public Administration, GMPA program already did this kind of competition earlier than a month. And then at the time, a lot of the good report actually presented. And uh, so the, the, some of them want to participate in the competition, but uh, they uh, give more, they want to give more opportunity to other students in the SNU. And so the, today, I want to celebrate the, uh, the winners of the GMPA competitions uh, 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 at the same time with this SNU level. It will be okay? Okay, so uh, who are the other winners? So the first, the honorary mention, uh, Roderick Molonga and Likalemi from DR Congo. <laughs> and second prize winner, Richard Leon. Uh, Richard Leon is from Peru. And another second prize winner, George Asenso Broby and Esther Ama Benewa from Ghana. And last, the first prize winner, Kara Kalansingin, Christine Mamuyak, Augustus Darak, from Philippines. And Trin uh, so Marianne Chang from Trina Tobago, she was uh, absent at the moment, so we are giving a prize right now. <laughs> so closing remarks. Uh, to Okay, um, we are already hungry, so the, I want to the, uh, close this meeting, but the, this meeting will go uh, in future. Uh, hopefully, uh, if we do this well, uh, work well, then we may uh, have the another round of the, uh, not the competition, another round of symposium to share the ideas. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions, and uh, see you around together. Thank you. 
I forget to mention the, all the staffs of the ERIC who prepare this wonderful meeting. Thank you. So this is the end of the ceremony. Uh, thank you for your participation. And we need our name tag back. So you can have your contents inside, but we need to uh, have your name tag back. So uh, at the back of the uh, conference room, there is a staff collecting this name tag. So please hand it in. And thank you for your participation again. Thank you.